gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So grateful for the opportunity to worship you, to, to come together in this way, to feast upon your word together. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Filter out all that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now this is the church at Corinth, uh, the church of God, which has been sanctified in Christ Jesus and called. They are His sheep, and that by God's design. This is God's Word, not Paul's. I've stressed that uh, more than once. It is the infallible and inerrant Word of God. It is the Word that He wants us to know. The apostles were set forth last, appointed to death, a spectacle unto angels and to men. That's pretty much where we were in our last study. I do not believe that we are looking at Paul sarcastically pointing out to the believers there at Corinth just how great he and, and, and Apollos and Cephas were and, uh, and how awful the Corinthians are. What the Holy Spirit has done is given us a, uh, a good contrast between the flesh and the spirit what we ought to be in the spirit i'm sure you know that you have been born again begotten of god born again from above you're a new creation in christ jesus that does not mean that you weren't an old creation you were you were told that that you've crucified the old man with its affections and its lusts you've crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. So you have flesh and spirit. There's a, a battle going on. You, you have the works of the flesh that's, that are well outlined for you in Galatians chapter 5, which are contrasted with the fruit of the spirit. It's the new man. So we know that we, I, the person, has an old man and a new man, and the old man never does anything but sin. Not one thing good does he ever do. Even the plowing of the wicked is sin. The righteous acts of the wicked is sin, God says. So the old man doesn't do anything good. All he does is sin. But you are not your old man. The old man only sins. That's all it does. You also have a new creation that cannot sin. We saw that in our study through 1 John. Contrary to popular opinion, I believe the Scriptures are very, very clear that the new man has no ability, has no power, is what the text says, to sin. 1 John chapter 3, that which is born of God has no power to sin. Okay? Has no power to sin. So what the Holy Spirit has done in our present context is contrast these two conflicting natures. We are made the filth of the world system, the offscouring of all things unto this day, this is what the Holy Spirit writes through Paul. The application is also to us. Is that the true only, I mean, is that true only of Paul and Cephas? Or in fact, have you and I, who are members of the body of Christ, have we also been sent forth as witnesses, as sheep among wolves, as ambassadors for Christ? Or is that limited only to a certain few that the Holy Spirit has singled out, you know, as super Christians or something? I suggest that what was true of Paul and Apollos and Cephas is true of all of us 
just as the Corinthians. Uh, Christianity is not winning some great victory. We're not the overcomers as far as the world system is concerned. We don't try to clean up the flesh. God is not cleaning up the flesh. We are from God's standpoint overcomers, but we're not high, mighty, and noble in the main. Now clearly there must be some high, mighty, and noble because God says He didn't call many. So there are some high, mighty, noble, but not many. We are witnesses for Christ, a witness that says sin is paid for by an innocent victim, that being our Lord. Verse 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, and once again, I know you get tired of hearing me say it, these are God's words, not Paul's. Okay? I write. Now, you can say, you can say, you know, that, 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 well, the Holy Spirit is saying, I write not these things. You can say it's Paul, but it's the Holy Spirit. It's an absolute negative. I do not write these things to shame you, to put you to shame. It's a present tense. I'm not really trying to shame you as my children whom I love. Paul is not picking on these Corinthians. Uh, trying to point out what a great life that the apostles live and what a poor life that they live. What I believe, dearly beloved, that he's done. What he's done is he is beautifully contrast the work of the flesh with the life of the Spirit. I'm not writing these things. Absolutely not writing these things to put you to shame. Now keep in mind, these are the Corinthians here. I'm writing these things as the Holy Spirit to instruct you so that you understand how the flesh looks and how the Spirit looks. For though you have uh, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I've begotten you through the gospel. And I do, I do not believe, again, I do not believe this is hyperbole, you know, with the 10,000 instructors. What, you know, uh, you read the commentaries, they go on with various passages of, of, of Scripture where that they believe that Paul was exaggerating. Folks, I never exaggerate. Uh, I do try and blow it up so that you might see it. Is the Holy Spirit exaggerating? I mean, surely we don't have 10,000 instructors in Christ. Or do we? The word for instructors there in the Greek is guardians, those who look over you. And please, please keep in mind, this is not Paul. You know, Paul wouldn't know. I mean, what would Paul know? But if this is the Holy Spirit, and, and if you don't think it's the Holy Spirit, then we have one verse here that isn't God's Word. Okay. I mean, so, so how would you differentiate between you know, what verse is God's Word and what, what verse isn't? Uh, is God exaggerating here, folks? There are many who believe that this book contains God's Word. It's, and, and you have to use just a little dash of brilliance you know, to determine what, what is God's Word and what isn't. And there's a lot of people who believe that. And if you do, that's your business. I don't. I believe wholeheartedly this is God's Word. And this is the Holy Spirit saying, though you have. He doesn't say you might have, uh, maybe you have, or, you know, uh, let me blow this up so that you can see it, you know. You do have 10,000 guardians in Christ. This is what the text says. This doesn't say you might have. Maybe you have. I'd like for you to have. It says 10,000. Okay? 
And I, I wouldn't be surprised that 9,980 of those are angels. I don't, I don't know. The word for instructor in the authorized version is for a child trainer, a guardian, who looks over you. And I know that there are angels who look over you. Ministering spirits sent to look over you and me. You know, I, I took a trip once where someone, you know, right before I left, they prayed that God would, would cover the car with angels. You know, uh, the road, cover the road with angels, have angels direct all the traffic. Oh, I mean, he had thousands of angels between Missouri and Oklahoma. This text does not say maybe you have, you might have, or, or some of you have. What it says is, it says, for although you have 10,000 guardians, child directors in Christ, you don't have many fathers. Uh, those child directors may be the pastor uh, of a, a church, the Sunday school teacher, a mother, a father, an uncle, a brother, an aunt, a friend, but you probably don't have 10,000 of those. Okay, I seriously doubt that. Okay, I do not see hi hyperbole or, ex or exaggeration or doubt in this verse. I think, and I don't ask anyone to agree with me, that the text states that you have, so it could be that if you only have one person who helps you in your Christian life, then you've got 9,999 angels. I mean, I, I don't know, but you tell me, you tell me who those guardians are in Christ Jesus, because the text says, and especially the grammar says, without doubt, you have 10,000. Now, I'm certain that they do include humans like Paul or Apollos or Cephas, but I don't see any hy hyperbole here in the text. So I come to the conclusion that it includes those whom God has appointed to guard your life. I can't help but believe that m most of you have had, had some experience, at least sometime in your life, at one time or another, when something which on the face of it would appear to be miraculous. You know, somebody was there. You know, somebody grabbed the steering wheel. You know, somebody did something. I believe God has protectors, instructors, guardians over every one of us in, in the angelic realm. And if we really understand that, then that also is a part of that peace that passes understanding. It's a peace that I want you folks to know. Nothing can touch your life that doesn't go through God. And these guardians, what a wonderful peace to have. And these are child instructors or guardians in Christ. What a marvelous thought. Christ who, who loved us so much that He gave His life for us, that He died in our place. He paid our sin debt. How could you ever doubt the love of God? You know, the one who left the glory of heaven to die in your place when you were His enemy, when you were not seeking Him, you weren't working for Him, you weren't seeking after Him, you didn't want Him, and He loved you. He endured the, the torment of creatures whom He had spoken into existence, which he could have annihilated with just the, the blink of his eye or thought. And why? 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 Because he loves you. He always loved you. You don't have many fathers, not many fathers. So you at least had two fathers, but you didn't have three, okay? Because much of modern preaching says, well, for a while you were a son of the devil, and then by some 
wonderful thought you you considered that you were a sinner and that you ought to do something about it and so you kind of stumble around and you accepted Christ at some point and uh, and now you're a new creation in Christ you know so now you have a new father God you had Satan was your father now you have a new father so you're no longer the devil's child Folks, you are never the devil's child. If you are God's child, you are always God's child. This, my, my son, was lost and is found. But he was always a son. He never was a child of the devil. Every plant which my father has not planted shall be rooted up. So he planted it right at the beginning. It was planted as wheat, it grew as wheat, and it was harvested as wheat. It was never terror. There isn't a possible application of that message in Matthew 13 that any tear ever changed into wheat, and likewise, goats never changed into sheep. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, you were always His. You didn't know it, but you were always His. You were at one time His enemy. You weren't seeking Him. Like the prodigal son, you were, you were squandering all that He gave you. I mean all that He gave you. Breath, you know, air, strength, brains, money. You know, those are all gifts from God. You were squandering all of that. But the Holy Spirit led you to realize that in your Father's house there's forgiveness of sin and acceptance. So you've always had a heavenly Father and all of you have an earthly Father. I mean, there's some who may have stepfathers. But you absolutely do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you by means of the Gospel. Okay, this is Paul. Okay, and now and so now we have sermons that are preached telling you how Paul brought them to birth by means of the gospel. That's what he did. He, Paul, caused them to be born again by the preaching of the gospel. And that's the application that they make. And folks, you may make that application. I cannot. This word begotten occurs quite a few times in the New Testament. I, I don't want to go through, you know, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. But in the sense that it refers to our spiritual new birth, the, that, the particular occurrence that we're interested in is, is when it has to do with our birth, our new birth. I have begotten you, okay? Did Paul do that is my question. Is this the Word of God? Or is it the word of Paul saying to the Corinthians that, that he's the one who brought them to birth, that begat them? I mean, or is God saying it is God who brought them to birth? I'd like to take the time to go through, you know, just about every place that the word is used when it speaks of us being born again. I don't have that, that kind of time in one video born again a second time by God from above, where the Word is used for our spiritual new birth. But we're going to look at some of that. You were God's child in Adam, and when Adam sinned, death followed. Okay? For by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. For when Adam sinned, all sinned. So you were dead. You were dead. But you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That you were once alive in Adam. Okay? If you weren't alive in Adam, well, then how were you dead in Adam? How did you die in Adam? Sin entered the world, and death by sin, for all sinned. Having sinned in Adam, all died. 
Okay? Having sinned in Adam. Well, how were you dead if you, if you hadn't first been alive? Clearly, if you died in Adam, then you were alive in Adam. And now you're dead. And God removes Adam's transgression so that you could be born again. So you do have a second birth. Born again, born from above. I love the phrase born from above. I always have. But it's born a second time. I think in the context, it really means born a second time. I say that because of First Peter. So let's look at these verses. At some of these verses. The first place that this Greek word applies to us is in John chapter 1, uh, 11 through 13. Uh, it's, uh, he came unto his own, his, his, his own uh, received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And uh, let's see, that's where we stop. Uh, it's so uh, he came unto his own his own received him not you don't want to stop okay you know that's where the evangelistic service begins and we and, and, and so you know and we now preach it but you know the sentence doesn't end there which were born not of blood not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God who were born already. It is a perfect passive, folks. It should be translated, who had already been perfectly born, not of blood, not of their race, nor of the will of the flesh, uh, not of their will, nor the will of man, not the evangelist, uh, not the father, the mother, the navigator, the missionary, but by the will of God. That's how that they were born. Passive voice. They had nothing to do with it, okay? All right? What would give me or anyone else the right to tell you that if you want, wanted to be born again, well, here's how, you, here's how you do it. You know, one, two, three, four steps, ten steps, you know, I don't know. And that is the very wisdom of the world, which is foolishness to God, which we've been looking at in this study. I think the most billions of sermons, okay, on how to be born again. I mean, this is what you got to do without one verse of Scripture to support such a concept. Why? Because God never said anything like that at all, okay? Who in their right mind would ever suggest that any baby had anything to do with its birth? The reformers years and years before you and I ever thought of, of, of living declared that it is inconceivable that anyone would suggest that any man, any woman, any person had anything to do with his birth, okay? His spiritual birth. They weren't born by the will of the flesh. They weren't born because, well, because they were Jews or because they were rich people, or, or anything else. They weren't born by their own will, their own volition. They weren't born by the will of man. You know, by somebody that decided to win your soul for Christ. You know. But they had been born by God's will. So it is He who made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. The next uh, couple places that we see this is in John chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, kind of lost here on these slides. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Okay? Completely born again in past time. It's another passive voice. And we're looking at the present reality of that. In fact, he cannot see the kingdom of God, so he didn't have anything to do with that birth. 
And that applies to all of those in John chapter 3. The next place that we see this word used for us is, is here in our, our present text. Uh, I've begotten you again in Christ Jesus. It's an aorist in this case. And that I believe to be God, not Paul. And then 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. A quickening spirit. Okay? Now, this is not our word begat, but, but Jesus Christ was made the quickening spirit. Not you. Not me. Not the missionary. Not your parents. No one. Okay? No one else but God. Galatians chapter 4, a couple of verses there, but as, but, as, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Once again, the person had no participation in that birth. Okay? A uh, couple of verses in Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians 1, 4, 4 and 5 according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Note how it's just, it's so clear, okay, in these verses. His will. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things, after the counsel of his own will, if you, if you go on reading, you'll, you'll see it even more. Unto the praise of his glory. You didn't do anything, okay? You didn't do anything. There's a, a Ephesians 2.5. You know, it, it was in a, in a condition of death that he gave you life. Even when we were dead, he gave us life. Colossians 2.13 and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened, there's the word quickened again, together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All trespasses. All of them. Okay? All of them, folks. <laughs> Every trespass. Your life was future to that text in Colossians. James 1.18, of His own will begat He us with the word of truth. Don't, don't Christians study anymore? Don't pastors study anymore? That we, we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. Not our will. It wasn't your will. It wasn't my will. It was God's will. 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, mercy, that's what it was according to. Hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He caused it. Okay? And again, it is a perfect passive. We're looking at the present reality of what God has completed and God did it. Passive voice. We had nothing to do with it. He caused, He, that is God, caused us to be born again. He caused us to be born again. Okay? Now, maybe that was because of someone's, some person's testimony. Uh, maybe you saw, saw something on a billboard. I don't, I don't know. Or some, some scripture you read. But God did it. And He did it in past time. Past time. 1 Peter 1.23, being born again not of not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth forever first john 2:29 if we know that he's righteous ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him and there's several others Clearly, God is, is the author, okay, and the finisher of our faith. Or do we just like quoting the verse without thinking about what it's saying? 
He caused us to be born again. He'll finish what He started. I have begotten you through the gospel by means of the gospel. It's a mistake, folks, to say that Paul is saying that by coming to Corinth and by preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, I, Paul, caused you to be born again. That is not what Paul did. That's not what the text is saying. I do not think the text is saying that Paul is their spiritual father. Okay? I know. I know there's many a minister who, you know, feels that they've caused someone to be born again. Okay? And in some sense, they consider themselves to be those people's spiritual father. Now, I'm not saying that you can't make that application from this text. You can, if you care to. Dearly beloved, I cannot. I have minister friends who've told me over the years about the people that they've led to Christ. But I, I, don't, even, I don't believe that they even did that. They certainly didn't quicken them to life, nor did uh, the one that they minister to become born again by something that they did, some decision on their part, something, something that they did. Folks, I've been teaching the Scriptures now for over 30 years. 30, 33, I believe. 30, going on 34 years now. And I know of no one that I have ever led to Christ. I know of some I've helped understand that they were born again by God before the world was created. Only the Holy Spirit can open anyone's eyes to truth. Whatever the Holy Spirit is pleased to do in using you or me or any other person in teaching the truth of this book, It is not us. It is the Holy Spirit. I believe He worked through Paul. He worked. I believe He worked through Apollos. I believe He worked through Cephas. He, he worked through these Corinthians. I believe He works through us. But He is the one that gives life. We do not. You can't ever argue someone into accepting Christ or believing Christ, or believing the Scriptures, who is not God's child. Won't happen, okay? I don't know who belongs to God. So I always preach the Gospel that we were given. I have great news. I have wonderful, fantastic news for you, okay? That Gospel message, that good news, has absolutely nothing in it asking you to do anything. If you have to do something, it isn't the good news. You know, is I have a job for you for you. I have good news for you. You know, I got a job for you. You got to run that wheelbarrow. You know, that is not good news. I have great news for you. Jesus Christ died for you, our sins according to the scriptures. If you are one of His sheep, the Holy Spirit will seal that to your heart. God's good news is Jesus Christ. God became man, lived the perfect life we couldn't live. He died for our sins. He died in your place. He was buried and He rose from the dead on the third day, according to the Scriptures, victorious over death, and that according to the Word of God. That's my good news. And His sheep will hear His voice, and His sheep will believe on Him whom God has sent. They will do that. You are not God's child by doing, but by grace. I think it's, it's a reason why so many don't, one reason why so many don't have peace and assurance is because, well, they believe that they started something and, well, therefore they must be able to, to stop it or undo what they did. Dearly beloved, I love you all truly. I, I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve.
Thanks for watching.